So again, uh, Jenny, thank you for the opportunity to be here um, this morning or afternoon, as you said. Um, it's again, um, really nice to see that a lot of you have joined um, the call uh, to hear about uh, the monoclonal gammopathies, which uh, clearly is an area of uh, great interest um, for both the physicians taking care of patients with myeloma and related disorders, and obviously for a lot of people who are living with those um, conditions. And what I'm going to try and do this morning um, is sh show a few slides. So use the slides as a way to just um, introduce the topic and talk about it a little bit. And as you already heard from uh, Jenny, we are going to have a Q&A section, which is probably going to be taking the bulk of the time today after Dr. Gopriel's presentation as well. So I'll just start off by talking about the, you know, the main actor when we talk about the monoclonal gammopathies, and those are the plasma cells. And these are mature white cells of, of the B cell family. And they all have a very important function, which is making antibodies or immunoglobulins to help us all fight infections. While abnormalities of the plasma cells can lead to a variety of different disorders, what we are going to focus on today is uh, in the malignant transformation or uh, the abnormality in the plasma cell that leads them to proliferate or divide in an uncontrolled fashion, uh, leading to the spectrum of monoclonal gammopathies. And what they do is normally to secrete immunoglobulins. As I said, uh, these are proteins that your body uses to try and fight infections. Now, they are made of two what we call heavy chains, which are bigger molecules and two smaller compartments or two smaller pieces, which are the light chains. Now, the heavy chains can be five different types, and I'm sure many of you have heard about this already uh, in your reports. They are, typically, they are either IgG or IgA, so, and in a smaller number of patients, it can be IgM and rarely IgE or IgD. And the light chains, which are the smaller pieces, they are the kappa or the lambda type. Typically, they all are bound to each other, so there's two of those heavy chains and two of the light chains that are um, bound together and secrete as what we call an intact immunoglobulin. So when we talk about this whole family of abnormalities called the monoclonal gammopathies, they are all um, symbolized by the presence of clonal plasma cells. So these are plasma cells, but they're abnormal and that's why we call them clonal because they all originate from um, what we believe may be a one or two abnormal plasma cells, which they continue to grow in an uncontrolled fashion. And they all um, typically would secrete these immunoglobulins or at least the light chains, the kappa or the lambda light chain, which is what we refer to as the monoclonal protein. And this monoclonal protein can be present either in the blood or they can be found in the urine. So when you think about the monoclonal gammopathies as a spectrum, uh, and this is just an example of the number of patients that we have seen at Mayo Clinic over a long period of time, you can see that the vast majority of the people who have a monoclonal protein in their blood or urine uh, have monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And this number here is probably underrepresented because of the, the fact that you know, more patients with conditions that need to be treated like myeloma are more likely to be referred to um, at a hospital like Mayo Clinic. So if you were to just go out and look in the, in the community and identify people with a monoclonal protein um, suggesting a monoclonal gammopathy, 90 plus percent of those patients will have what we call a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined uh, significance or MGUS, um, as Jenny already uh, mentioned. For some reason, the slide seems to have its own life. Um, so uh, the less uh, common are the smoldering multiple myeloma, and then um, obviously patients with mu multiple myeloma and amyloidosis and a variety of other related conditions um, that typically often uh, need uh, some treatment. So the mucus and the small ring myeloma are two conditions that we often refer to as precursor diseases uh, to uh, multiple myeloma. Because as Jenny already mentioned, all patients with myeloma have to have had monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance at some point in time. Now, where do we typically find plasma cells, right? To make that diagnosis of monoclonal gammopathy, as I mentioned, we depend on often the presence of the monoclonal protein and in some of the patients also the presence of monoclonal plasma cells. 
And as you can see here on the left-hand side, these are how the plasma cells look like in a bone marrow. They all have this darker nucleus that's typically pushed to one side. And then they have that bluish, what we call the cytoplasm or the rest of the cell uh, that takes up the rest of the, um, uh, the cell in this picture. So typically we would find that in the bone marrow when you do a bone marrow aspiration or a bone marrow biopsy. But you can also find that in what we call plasma cytomas, which are basically um, the swellings or soft tissue um, or bone related deposits from where you can do biopsies, where you can see sheets of these plasma cells. And, and if you do more sensitive testing, we can also find them circulating in the bloodstream, as you can see on the right hand side, again, those um, cells with the nucleus pushed to one side. Now, what about the, the monoclonal protein or the immunoglobulins of the light chains? Now, for the years, what we have, the way we have identified them is by using a test called protein electrophoresis, which can be done either on the serum or from the, on the blood, or they can be done on a 24 hour collection of the urine. And again, you can see on the, um, on the left hand side um, the, of these electrophoresis is a normal looking one. And on the right hand side, you can see. A, what, we, what is marked here as a M spike. And this is what it, um, is, it represents the abnormal protein, which is secreted by these abnormal cells. Now the electrophoresis tells us how much of the M protein is there um, or the M spike is there, but it doesn't tell you what type of M spike you have. And for that, we use a test called immunofixation where we can again, break them down to see, are they a G heavy chain or a A heavy chain? In this particular example, it's a G. You can see this dark band up here. And lower down, you can see a dark band in demonstrating or suggesting that this is a kappa light chain. So obviously this particular example, the person has a IgG kappa monoclonal protein. And in about 15% of people, we may not be able to show that they have a heavy chain, but they may still have a light chain that is in excess. And those patients we can detect or rather measure um, the serum light chains by using a test called the free light chain assay. And that will tell you whether there's too much of a kappa light chain or too much of lambda light chain, and also tells you how much of light chain is there. Now, the reason why we want to measure these monoclonal protein is because that is one way we would track how uh, the monoclonal gammopathy is doing over time. So um, one of the questions that always comes up is what causes monoclonal gammopathies? Now we don't completely understand why someone would develop these abnormalities in the plasma cells and the plasma cells starts dividing without any control. But we do know that there are certain subgroups of patients who might be at a higher risk of getting them. One of them is the African-Americans. We know that they have a higher risk, two to threefold higher risk compared to Caucasians. We don't have very good data from the Asian population or the Hispanic population, but it's widely believed that they may be at a lower risk than uh, Caucasian. We know that people who have been exposed to chemicals or radiation exposure have a higher risk of getting monoclonal gammopathies. Similarly, we also know that first degree relatives of people with a monoclonal gammopathy have a two to three four higher risk of have getting monoclonal gammopathy or being diagnosed with one. So when you think about this whole spectrum on the, the, the initial stages is the monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance or MUGGAS, which everybody has before they go on to developing smoldering myeloma or active myeloma. Um, and in some of um, the individuals, we can identify a phase that we refer to as smoldering myeloma before it actually becomes an active or symptomatic myeloma. And what happens during this transition from MGUS to active myeloma, the first thing is the increasing amounts of monoclonal protein that you can uh, measure on the electrophoresis. And if you were to do bone marrow biopsy, we can also see that there's increasing uh, amount of plasma cells in the bone marrow. And what really makes the myeloma stand out is because now you're having issues um, related to the M protein or related to the monoclonal plasma cells that you start having problems with your kidneys or your bone, and which makes it very clear that we need to do something about it. But in between the smoldering myeloma phase, you don't have any of that uh, side effects or the what we call the endogen damage. But increasingly, we are starting to look at this group of patients to see, can we actually do something to prevent it from going to active myeloma? Can we do something before the other shoot drops, as Jenny was mentioning? So how do we know who is going to get myeloma, right? That is the important, that is what 
always is uh, the difficult thing to predict. Um, and for people who are living with the monoclonal gamopathy, they have undetermined significance or smoldering myeloma, they are under this constant concern that myeloma is going to, um, going to come on. What we know is that patients with monoclonal gamopathy of undetermined significance, as you can see in the lower line, the risk of getting myeloma is about 1% per year and remains constant over time. Um, so even though the risk is low, the risk is always there, which means we have to continuously um, uh, monitor these patients. In contrast, those with smoldering myeloma have a much higher risk. So almost half of these patients would get myeloma in the first five years, another 16, 15% over the next five years. And after that, it's about 1% per year. So the key thing is, you know, if you can very specifically identify who is going to get myeloma, then not only can we do something about maybe trying to prevent it from happening, but we also can reassure the remaining people that, we, that they, they don't have to keep worrying about this getting to myeloma. So there are a lot of different ways we have tried to identify those people who have what we call a high-risk smoldering myeloma or high-risk muggers just to identify those people with the higher risk so that we can watch them very closely. Now, the good thing uh, is that, you know, if you watch uh, patients with smoldering myeloma very closely, uh, their risk of getting something um, dramatic, you know, very drastic um, or, or, you know, the kidneys just shutting down, um, things like those things don't happen overnight. And we have, we do have plenty of warning as long as we can watch these numbers very closely. But it's obviously, we don't want to do that for everyone. We want to do that for the people who are at the highest risk. And we also don't want to try and do some treatment for everyone. We want to try and intervene only when they have the highest risk of progression. So there are different models that have been developed. One of them has been this uh, recent one, the 20 to 20 or 20, 20, 20, which looks at the bone marrow plasma cells, which look at the free light chain levels, and also um, look at the, um, the M spike levels to see who are at the highest risk. Now, this is only part of the story, and actually, as Dr. Gobiel will get into, there are several other factors that can also be used, like the, the genetic makeup of the plasma cells, which can tell you uh, who might be at a higher risk of progressing to um, uh, active myeloma, so that maybe we can do something about it. So um, again, so I think the important point I just wanted to make get across to everyone is that you know, the majority of the patients in, or people in whom we identify a monoclonal protein, um, we don't really need to do anything um, uh, about that other than just watching them very closely. And I think as we try to understand the, uh, the, the mechanisms through which this progress, I think we'll, we'll be able to tell those people who are at the lowest risk um, to or reassure them and so that we don't, they don't have to constantly worry about it. And the people who are at the highest risk, maybe we can really do something about it to try and alter that risk um, um, of um, progressing to active myeloma. So maybe I'll stop there. And I think there are a lot of questions. Maybe this we use that as uh, opportunity for question and answer sessions um, and all um, later on. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you.